I'm the woodpecker today. I'm building a jointer. I already have a 6 inch jointer. On narrow pieces, it works pretty well. But on pieces wider than 6 inches, I have to remove the cutter guard to joint them. Then I have to end line the rest of the board. But since I saw Matthias Wandel's 12 inch jointer on woodgears.ca, I dream of building one. I even bought a brand new thickness planner on sale just for that. Yes, I bought it just for the parts. The first thing to do is to dismantle it to get the mortar and the cutting head. The motor and the roller gears are in one block, so I have to remove the gears from the motor. Here they are, apart from the motor. But I have a small problem. The motor back bearing is held by the gears casing and the whole thing is way too big to fit inside the jointer. So I cut a piece of plywood with the shape of the gears housing. After marking and drilling the holes, I screw both pieces to the motor. Now I have the motor. I need the cutter head. I remove the pulley first, then the bearings spring clip. I take out both bearings. Then I can remove the cutter head. Now I'm all set with all the pieces I need to build my jointer. But my motor is different from the one Matthias used. So I must make a different type of support for it. I start by making a quarter inch wide groove on a quarter inch thick plywood and rough cut it to size. I cut it in half and glue both pieces together. This will be the pivot base of my motor. I just have to make sure both pieces are well aligned so a quarter inch stainless steel rod fits inside both grooves and I leave this to dry. The next morning, I can cut the base to its final dimensions. Then I measure and drill the holes to screw the motor to the base. I don't trust the original screws, so I add two big hose clamps around the motor. I just need to drill a series of holes and clean between them so the hose clamp can go through the slots. The last thing to do on the base is to install the T-bolt, which will act as the motor belt tensioner. Then I can assemble it all. Now you can see what the motor looks like on its base. Now I can start to work on the jointer's frame. I decided to use Baltic birch plywood for the whole frame. After cutting a 4x8 sheet to a more manageable size, I glued two strips together for the front and back of the jointer. I clamp this and leave everything to dry. During this time, I can work on the cutter edge support. After sticking two small pieces of plywood together with double-sided tape, I stick the pattern on this sandwich and drill the hole on the top one. For the second one, I use the pilot hole the previous one did to guide the cut. This looks so simple, eh? 
but these are all the holes I made before finding the right size for the hole for both cutter head supports. Then with the bansa table tilted, I cut the second part of the cutter head bearing support. Finally, I can glue both pieces of both supports together. Now that the glue of both front and back is dry, I trim both of them to their final size. I also make all the other tricky cuts on them. The only belt I found was a little smaller than the one on the plants, and my base is also different too. So I print a full scale version of the front and with a sewing thread I find the new placement for the motor. I modify the plants, print it and mark the center for the motor. Again, using the wing cutter I drill a big hole on the front of the jointer. At one point, it was too deep for the cutter, so I removed some wood and continued to cut. When the hole is done, using a small nail, I mark the corners of the motor pivot block and mark where to cut it. I also trace a new form for the motor's hole. This cut must be straight, so I clamp the front on my table saw and with my thinnest blade, I cut the bottom of the motor pivot block by raising the saw blade. It's not that bad. I'm satisfied with it. For the rest of the cuts, I try to use my jigsaw. And here you can see why I never use this tool. I finish the cuts with a coping saw. chisels and a flush trim saw. The rest is done with the sander. The last thing I do for the motor mount is to drill the pivot hole on the two pivot blocks. Now that the glue of the bearing mounts is dry, I can shape them and drill their mounting holes. To dry this, I must put the bearings back on the cutter head. After putting the cutter head in place, I can check the belt and confirm that my measurements were really off. I changed the form of the motor hole and drill a second hole in both motor pivot blocks. Then with a chisel, I cut the power switch hole and cut a groove for the electrical wire. Then I cut drill all the necessary holes, glue and screw both end caps of the jointer. Then I cut both bottom panels, glue and screw them in place. Now I can firmly bolt both motor pivot blocks. When the motor is in place, I bend the belt with a bolt from under the jointer. Now, that's the sound of a nicely tight belt. I couldn't stop myself. I wanted to try the cutter head. No vibration. 
So far, it's a success. Now I can start working on both jointers tables. I cut all the pieces a little bigger and cut the special shape on the bandsaw. To glue both layers of the table together, I pre-drill some holes under both tables. Then I chamfer all the inside holes, so when I'll screw them together, the wood won't push them apart. Next, I spread glue on both layers and screw them together. The next morning, I cut both tables to their final dimensions. Then I make the pattern for the infeed table parallelogram links. After cutting it, I drill the holes for the three stainless steel shaft. I trace the link's shape four times on another piece of plywood and cut them. Then I screw the pattern on them and use the holes I made earlier as drilling guides. Even if it's unnecessary, I sand the edge of the links. Now I can cut all the stainless steel rods for the links pivots. Normal steel rods would have also be okay for the old jointer. When they're cut, I grind the small chamfer on their ends. To make sure every link has its hole at the same location, I insert three rods through all of them. It's time to mill all the maple pieces to finish the parallelogram. After, with the drilling guide, I drill all the necessary holes in them. Here you can see the parallelogram assembled and working perfectly. Next, I dismantle it and drill the mounting holes for the table and the frame. Then I can put it in place. On the lowest rails, I screw a piece of plywood, which will hold the tilting mechanism screw block. Before I can put the infeed table on the parallelogram, I must make four holes to clear the top of the links. I square up the corners with chisels. With a dowel center's finder, I find the placement of the table's threading rod holes and drill them. Then I screw them directly in the wood. I use a block to help me screw them straight. Look how great this works. Now I can make all the pieces for the crank, which will move the infeed table. When the plywood for the crank is cut, I glue the pieces together along the threaded rod with epoxy. This is the block in which the parallelogram will move. I drill and screw four screws to hold the T-bolt in place. 
Now, I just need to screw the block in place. Look how this works fine. I need to complete a couple of small things before I close the motor section. I cut and install the chip deflector around the cutter head, then I make an air baffle around the motor. I find this form by cutting a piece of cardboard to the right shape. Then I cut this shape out of a thin piece of plywood. Now I can take care of the dust port. The bolt from the motor pivot blocks are in the way. So I cut a strip out of the dust port. With a small part removed from it, it fits like a glove. I just need to re-glue both pieces together. To do so, I re-glue the small part I removed on top of it with epoxy. Then, with another cardboard pattern, I find the shape of the belt guard, trace it on another piece of plywood, and cut it to shape. To complete the guard, I glue some strips around its edges, so the belt will turn inside. After installing the outfit table, I mark the placement for the fence's locking bolt on the fence's base at both ends. Then, I drill the holes over the two marks I made. On the router table, I route a slot between those two holes. I make this in five passes, raising the bit in between each passes. After it's completed, I make and assemble all the pieces needed to complete the fence. The last thing to do for the fence is the knob to hold it in place. The bottom part is cut with an old saw. And the knob part is cut on the band saw and finished on the sander. Next, I drill a hole smaller than the nut size and jam it inside with a vise. I glue both pieces together to complete the knob. Now it's time to work on the cutting guard. I use old wood for the cutting guard mount. After installing it to the infeed table, I cut the guard and glue its pivot. The jointer is almost finished. I only need to make a bevel on one end of each tabletop metal plate. After that, I clean the edges with a file. I also need to drill a series of holes on both metal sheets to be able to screw them to the tabletops. After cleaning the oil from the metal, I can screw them. Finally, I can try it for the first time. I take this opportunity to straighten the birch I bought for the base. I assembled the banks with dominoes, for speed and convenience. But the original plans call for Dowell's joinery. The back rail of the banks is wider, so I can cut out the shape of the dust board. This way, I can always remove it 
so the shaving can fall on the floor. After making sure the dust parts fits, I glue the front and back of the base. While the glue dries, I disassemble the jointer so I can put some finish on it. When it's all apart and the glue of the base is dry enough, I can glue both front and back together. I sand most of the pieces to remove the pencil lines and the stains I made. I have a metal cabinet full of old paint, but I have no green. So I mix yellow and blue to make a nice green color and paint some parts with it. Both tables are varnished with an oil-based varnish. The rest of the pieces are varnished with a water-based varnish. When the paint and varnish are dry, I install the casters and reassemble it together. Under both tables, I stick some tin foil to balance the moisture between the metal top and the bottom. Then I install the tables. Before screwing the metal sheets on the tables, I spray metal sealant under the sheet. Then I screw them in place. Next, I spray sealant on top also. But this time, I rub it so the top will be slicker. Then I adjust the outfit table so it's 25 tau over the cutter head cylinder. I install the fence. the belt guard and the cutter guard. I stick some slippery tape on the edges of the cutter guard so the paint won't stain the wood to joint and install it. After putting the jointer in its base, I screw it in place. And voila, my new jointer is all finished. I just need to put it to good work. If this kind of thing interests you, this is the rest of the 4x8 sheet of plywood I used to build the jointer. I had to cut those two pieces out of another piece of plywood. This is an overview of the spending I made to build this jointer. On the final cast, I added the small things I had to buy. The casters, glue, screws, and other stuff. Here is my new 12-inch wide jointer. If you want to make one yourself, just do like I did. And buy the plants at woodgears.ca and believe me, you won't regret it. Thanks, and we'll see each other on the next episode of The Woodpecker.